Hello, I'm Ruth Green, and welcome to our Clips and Conversation event for a discussion with an outstanding panel about the important issues highlighted in the new documentary, The Right to Read. This is a warm-up event for tomorrow's California Reading Summit. If you haven't registered, you still can at careads.org slash summit. This documentary is about the early literacy crisis in America and what we can do about it. It is directed by the award-winning filmmaker, Jenny McKenzie, and executive produced by LeVar Burton, who of course is a true reading legend. For those who don't know about the literacy crisis, consider these facts about California. In 2019, before the pandemic, less than half of all third graders were reading at grade level. Over 70% of low-income Black and Latino students were reading below grade level. And according to one study, third graders who don't read proficiently are four times more likely to leave high school without a diploma. And sadly, 70% of California's incarcerated population is illiterate. I'm not sure why we aren't all talking about this literacy crisis, but the hope of this film is to get the conversation started. Because as a society, if we want to deliver on the promise of equality, inclusion, and social justice, it has to start with literacy and every child's right to read. Now to introduce our amazing panel of experts. Kareem Weaver is a nationally known education advocate committed to supporting student achievement and opportunity with a focus on literacy. He currently serves as a member of the Oakland NAACP Education Committee and as a leader of Fulcrum, which stands for Full and Complete Reading is a Universal Mandate. Previously, Kareem was an award-winning teacher and administrator in Oakland, California and Columbia, South Carolina. The importance of Kareem's leadership in reframing the issue of literacy as a civil right cannot be overstated. Next, we have Emily Hanford, who has been working in public media for more than two decades as a reporter, producer, news director, and program host. She has written and produced pieces for NPR, the New York Times, and many other publications, winning numerous awards, including Excellence in Media Reporting on Education Research Award and Emily's groundbreaking podcast episode, Hard Words, on why children aren't being taught to read was the winner of the inaugural Public Service Award from the Education Writers Association in 2019. Emily's breakthrough reporting in these major publications has literally changed the debate for the public at large, shining a light on the real reasons our kids can't read. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Kimyana Burke, who is a policy fellow with Excel in Ed, where she supports states pursuing a comprehensive approach to K-3 reading policy with a heavy focus on successful implementation. As state literacy director at the Mississippi Department of Education, she led the implementation of Mississippi's Liter Literacy-Based Promotion Act with phenomenal results. She began her career as an elementary reading teacher and also taught English in middle and high school. Dr. Burke is making it happen on the ground on a statewide level. Her efforts are the one of the reasons Mississippi has made such tremendous gains demonstrating what actually can be achieved. And finally, a little bit about myself. I'm Ruth Green. I previously served as the president of the California State Board of Education, as well as a local board member in Santa Barbara, California. I have long focused on literacy issues. So, okay, let's get started. The first clip introduces us to Kareem Weaver and what he's seen in Oakland classrooms for the past 20 years. Ready? Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. I did everything I could to put my kids in the best position to be successful. Uh, hi. Good, very good. I love it. I got black kids. They can't afford to be illiterate. I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure they get every possible opportunity. And as a teacher, 
I always try to do the same thing for the kids in my classroom. Joyful. We already found the sounds. We said, uh, ooh. Literacy is our greatest civil right. You can't read, you can't access society. We got breakfast in the oven. convince people to actually teach kids how to read. I'm playing devil's advocate. I know. What is the point of learning how to read? Convince me. Imagine being in the Stone Age and you ain't got no stone. Imagine being in the Bronze Age and you ain't got no bronze. All right, we in the information age right now. You can't read the information. Millions of American kids struggle to read. Americans need universal access to quality education. Every child must start school ready to learn. We should succeed in seeing that every eight-year-old can read independently. We need to prepare our children to read and succeed in school so that no child is left behind. But the way that children are usually taught how to read does not line up with decades of evidence on how they actually learn to read. Give our kids that chance. The greatest equalizer in the world is education. I have taught every grade level, taught high school, middle school, uh, elementary school, and there are a few through lines, uh, one of which is, is the kids can't read. California, arguably the most progressive state in the union, social justice minded. But when I first started teaching in Oakland, there were two kids in my class of 35 who could read. Larry, say what's up to the camera, Larry. What's up? All right, now, Larry, take it from the top. What does that say? Larry ran to the cab. My man, Larry. I'm gonna say this right now on tape. My man, Larry, just read his first sentence by himself, and I'm very, very proud of him. And whoever sees this videotape, I'm hoping I can get his mother to see it too. <laughs> I want them to know that Larry can read. And Larry will read, won't you? Yeah. Right on. The question is, what becomes of those kids who don't have a foundation in reading? I can tell you what happens to them. Uh, now, Lord works in mysterious ways. Kids, you know, overcome all kinds of challenges. However, illiteracy is the pipeline to prison. It's also the pipeline to homelessness. It's the pipeline to unemployment. There are publishing companies that sell popular curriculum that do not teach our children to read, making millions of dollars. From the day I set foot in Oakland, I realized that everything starts with literacy. Everything starts with reading. Science, math, history, you name it. If you can't read, you can't access anything else. Okay, Kareem, I have a two-part question for you. First, what motivates you? And then we've been looking at this through the eyes of Oakland and California, but now it's part of this national movement. Why now, and why now is the nation just getting interested in this? Um, thanks for the questions, Ruth. I think 
uh, what motivates me is a connection to my heritage. You know, I'm a, a foundational Black American. And so I have enslaved people who were enslaved in my family tree. And many of them were not permitted to learn to read. In fact, I have uh, my grandmother's great grandfather um, lost his life because his wife um, was breaking that rule. And so I've always felt a calling and purpose um, to wrestle with literacy and, and try my best to strike a blow as best I could. And I would just say, you know, the other thing that drives me is just, you know, my kid. So a little baby in that picture is now a young lady. She's uh, about to be off to college. And she uh, came to me one day, she saw a newspaper article that said 75% of Black boys in California can't read. And, you know, that may seem like it's just a stack, but in the real world, you know, where, where people try to make sense of their reality, that she was flummoxed. And she was like, Dad, what are you doing about this? It was a really serious issue and still is. And in terms of why now, I think the pandemic changed everything. I mean, people have been working on this for a long time. So it's nothing new for in terms of that. But the pandemic forced everybody to stay home. We actually paid attention to our kids. You know, uh, we're so busy ripping and running and doing different things, working, trying to pay the bills and doing whatever it is that we're doing. We just collectively kind of lost sight of whether or not the kid's okay. And that pandemic shut everything down. I mean, we, we first of all, we had to be with them. <laughs> we had to pay attention to them. And we started to notice some things as parents that we probably were too busy and too preoccupied to, uh, to notice before. So I think that's kind of what got us um, paying attention in, uh, nationally the way we should have been paying attention a long time ago. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that? Kimiana or Emily? Do I have a taker here? I thought I saw Kimiana. Go ahead, Kimiana. Yeah, <laughs> I was I was trying to find my mute button still after all this time. There we go. Um, we got you. Yes, uh, you know, uh, being in Mississippi, the poorest state in the nation, um, I think that we finally got to a point where we had um, some adults on the same page about um, what we could do what was really in our power to do um, in public education. Um, and it was to combat the literacy crisis in Mississippi. And, um, you know, as we'll, we'll continue to talk about this, this crisis, um, you know, about all the hands that we had to have on deck uh, and the buy-in that we had to get um, from, from others. And you would think, well, we're teaching kids how to read. Why do you need buy-in, right? But it was our approach. Um, to teaching kids how to read um, that that really involved a lot of boots on the ground efforts that you know as a state and as a state agency that we had not done before. Um, so that's what really kind of started our journey on it. And uh, and again, we we were at a point where we had to go big or go home. And now I think the nation is at this point where we we have to go big. Agreed, Emily. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know if I have too much to add to those two particular points. I know we're going to keep moving uh, on here in this conversation, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess picking up on what Kareem said, I think that the pandemic was an opportunity where a lot of parents actually got to see how their kids were being taught. Um, and I think that has raised awareness, but this has been a problem for a long time. Kareem has been fighting this fight for a long time. And I think there was awareness that's been building over time. And even, you know, I think just a whole bunch of things have come together and the pandemic is one, but I think a lot of things were sort of um, heading towards the moment that we're in now. And the pandemic was kind of an exclamation point. Um, but I think there was a lot of movement because of people like Kareem, because of a lot of parents across the country that have gotten very involved in this uh, in recent, you know, for many years, there's a very, um, active dyslexia community. And I think we can talk later about the connections. I think that the problems that children with dyslexia have 
just sort of make clear the problems that our chil all children are having because dyslexia is a continuum and we know that some some of us learn to read easily and some of us have a really a hard time and most of us are somewhere in between and we're just missing a lot a lot of kids who need help being taught how to read are being missed it's not just kids with dyslexia but they're just suffering the most absolutely agreed okay well thank you all um let's go on to our next clip then uh, and this next clip lays out some of the startling statistics about how many kids struggle with reading and raises a key question. Is the problem with the kids or with the way we teach reading? Let's find out. Reading is the basis upon which all other academic learning is built. So reading is basically going to determine so many things about how the rest of your school career goes. We have a lot of people who struggle to read. And it's kind of amazing if you look at the, just the basic data, like why aren't we screaming and yelling about this? There is one test that is given across all of America called the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP. It's the only test that we have that is given consistently across the nation. We've been giving it for decades. And what it shows is unfortunately mostly unchanged we are failing about two thirds of our children. NAEP is not a perfect test, but NAEP is telling us something essential. The data reveal a truth that we cannot ignore. So let's just take a look at the idea of just basic. <laughs> Who can read at a basic level? Well, we are in a situation where like a third of our fourth graders cannot even read at a basic level. That is a lot of kids. And it is even worse way more shocking if you look at kids of color. Nearly half of kids of color in fourth grade cannot read at a basic level. And then I'm wondering, well, what's wrong with me? Maybe it's my family. Maybe I'm too poor. Maybe I'm too black, too brown. Maybe it's because I speak a different language. Maybe because they went through too much, there's too much trauma. Maybe it's me. Parents have no idea. The root of the problem is children are being taught in a way that is not working. If it was a minority issue, then all these soccer moms wouldn't be spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to send their kids to private tutoring because they didn't learn how to read in school. Kids of all races are struggling to read. The issue is who has the resources to deal with it. So what we have in this country are a lot of well-to-do kids who are getting the help they need. And what happens is we just don't see in some ways the problem with the instruction because of that. Ip. Ship. I'm trying to enlist everybody's help because it's not just my community, it's the suburbs, it's the rural areas, it's cities all across the country. When parents send their babies off to school, I want them to ask teachers, principals, school boards, how are you teaching reading? Is it aligned with the research and the science? Okay. Emily, you asked a really important question. Why aren't people screaming and yelling about this? And why is it with these, why is it with these grim assessment numbers and the large body of peer-reviewed research that there is still such a debate and even resistance to better reading instruction? Yeah, well, that's the big question. <laughs> I mean, I think in some ways people have been screaming and yelling about it, but you know, every time those NAEP scores come out, there's an alarming set of stories and we point to the statistics and I think we've kind of gotten used to it. I think mm -hmm. it's just that reading scores have been so bad for so long that we've kind of uh, accepted that this is the way it is. And as Kareem rightly pointed out in the documentary, we're not looking closely enough at the instruction. Instead, we have essentially accepted the excuse that the reason kids aren't reading is uh, them and their families. So the excuse is, well, 
we have a lot of kids who are poor. Yes, we have a lot of kids who are poor. There are lots of poor kids who, who do and can learn to be very good readers. And there are lots of kids who are not poor who are struggling to read. So that doesn't get you very far. There's also a lot more struggling readers than there are kids living in poverty, if you just look at the numbers. Okay, so poverty is not does not fully explain it. Um, uh, we say that there are things like, well, the kids have reading disabilities, but we know from lots of research that really there is a relatively small proportion of kids who have serious reading disabilities in such a way that it should really impact their reading massively if they don't get good instruction. Like kids can learn to read with good instruction. Most kids can learn to read pretty well with good instruction. It's been shown in studies over and over again. So I think we've just kind of accepted it as a society. But I think the most important thing is it's, I think it's because we've kind of thought we can't do anything about it. It's like, we've got to fix poverty first or something, or we, I, you know, and, and I think what's happening now with the pandemic and with awareness that's being raised about this gigantic body of research on reading is that reading is something that needs to be taught. It is not something that we are born with brains that are ready to do. We have to be, we have to learn how to read. Most of us need some pretty good explicit instruction in how to do it. If we don't get it, we might get it at home because we're like one of Kareem's kids and our dad is there doing all kinds of things that are helping us learn to read or they're hiring tutors or whatever to make, to make sure that it happens. But parents all over the country are filling in the gaps when schools aren't actually teaching kids to read. And I think that just for too long, we have been enamored of instructional approaches in schools that don't explicitly teach kids how to read the words and all the many other skills they need to become good readers. I, I think this actually goes beyond reading instruction. I think we have sort of abandoned the idea that we're really teaching kids things in a direct and explicit way, and we're sort of expecting them to learn it. And that just necessarily ends up in huge gaps because some kids can have the gaps made up for them in various other ways because of the families they're from, the communities they're in, the brains they were lucky enough to be born with. And a lot of kids can't make up for those gaps. And so we're, um, yeah, I think we just, and I'll, I'll say one other thing just because I'm a journalist. I think that part of the issue has been the journalism actually. And I think that in general, education and education policy has been kind of covered a little bit the way politics kind of gets covered. I mean, this is, I'm being a little harsh here, but I think a lot of reporters have really looked at the policy side of things and really getting inside the classroom. What are the kids learning? How are they being taught? What is really going on inside the classroom? I don't think there's been enough of that reporting. And I, I think we need more reporters to go in and really see what are the kids learning? I would agree with that. Um, Kareem, Kimiana, jump in. Kareem? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, so it's interesting the way you phrased that question um, because this is nothing new. And I would say, you know, we're a distracted public. Okay, so it's it's not that we're not just, there's a lot of things that we're paying attention to, just not this. Um, I mean, you know, what time does a football game come on? You know, what are the housewives doing on TV? Um, what What's my social media look like? I mean, you know, I got to go to work. I'm working two jobs. <laughs> Whatever it is, we have so much going on. And that's why that pandemic was such a, 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 a jolt. Um, because it forced us to stop for a second and say, "What? Wait a second. What? You mean you can't? I thought I thought you could. We assumed a lot, and you know, one of the things that you that you saw in that, uh, one of the clips is that this isn't just an urban issue. We usually talk about this as an urban issue, which is code for people of color and and poor kids, uh, but it's not just a poor a poor thing or an urban thing or anything like that." In mass, we're not teaching kids to read. Now, that, that's what I hope people can get out of this. In Beverly Hills, in California, 71% uh, on the last test, 71% of the third graders are reading proficiently. Now, 
there's some people who would be jumping over chairs happy with 71%. 71, Beverly, all the money that folks can throw at this thing, all the tutoring and the specialists and the support and all, whatever else, three out of 10 still not reading. And that's up from uh, 2015, I believe it was 64, 64, 65%. So we're talking about writ large, a society that has slid towards illiteracy because we've been too distracted um, with whatever else is going on to really focus on our kids. And that, that's hard to say, but mm -hmm. even me as a father, I look at some of the challenges my kids face and I say, how in the world did I let it get like this? What was right. I doing? And that's kind of what we have to ask ourselves. What have we been doing? As our, as our kids are, are just, you know, are not doing well in this area. Right. The status quo is okay. Kimyana, do you have something to add before we move on? Sure. I'll add that, um, you know, Emily's reporting, honestly, beginning back to, to 2018 with hard words. I think the message got to these, you know, our kitchen tables where these conversations really hadn't been had before. Um, and then comes the pandemic where uh, now parents are, are looking at their children and again, thinking that they were reading, but now understanding that they're guessing. So these things begin to click and say, I've heard something about it, but my, my child's teachers always said that he or she is fine, right? I get the report cards that say that they're, you know, they have A's or B's or they're doing satisfactory, they're doing well, um, but I really did not know. So I think that when we think about, okay, well now here we are. So what do we do next? And I think that we have to empower our parents and families, um, tell them which questions they really need to ask and to whom. You know, a lot of times they just go directly to the teachers. And sometimes the teachers are saying, I'm just doing what my administrator told me to do. And then the administrator said, well, we're using the curriculum that the, that the school board purchased, right, or, or, or approved. So we have to know which questions to ask and to whom. Um, and then also we have to, to be able to organize and to advocate. Um, and, and Decoding Dyslexia has done a great job of being a grassroots organization and being able to do that and really, and really fight for kids. But we have to be able to organize and advocate. And again, we have to lastly, educate our educators. Um, we, we really take a lot of things, you know, we assume a lot of things. Um, and we talk a lot about the science of reading, but we have to make sure that our, our teachers and leaders know what it is, um, know what it looks like in practice, and then also our faculty in, in the colleges of education to make sure that they are educated as well. Well, and that's an excellent segue to our next question. So moving along to the next clip, which lays out two schools of thought about how to teach reading, balanced literacy or structured literacy. My first year was honestly such a mess. This is just, uh, these are called base 10 blocks. We count the days that we've been in school every day. I didn't even know that I was supposed to have Lucy Calkins units of study in my classroom until I think the second week. Whole language, which is what that is, or balanced literacy has been proven not to work for my students. This school is the lowest performing in reading in the district. I mean, a lot of it, I think, is because the teacher turnover rate is extremely high. And also, I think, because we have been forced to use units of study. And two years ago, that's what I was teaching. The lesson was, basically, you cover up a word with a post-it note, and you're reading a book. And the students are supposed to guess the word. What word do you think would go here? And they guess random words. They don't know what it is because it's covered up. So then you pull back a little so that they can see one letter. And then you pull back a little bit more, and then you see who's right. Who guessed right? I don't know. I'm not a magician. You know what I mean? Mom got the balloons. Oh, how did you know that word said balloons? Because on the picture I saw balloons. I paint mm -hmm. the fence purple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how you're reading without even looking at the at the words. I paint the door purple. Great. Look at all that purple. Mm-hmm. Let's see 
see what happens when we take away the pictures. I put my swig up. There's been a lot of opinion about how children learn to read, and there's been a lot of conflict over the years about this. In fact, it was referred to as the Reading Wars at the end of the 20th century. It basically boiled down to whether children need to be taught some very explicit rules in order to learn to read, or whether they naturally learn to read. What we've been arguing about for a really long time is really the difference between what is a bottom-up approach to learning how to read or a top-down approach to learning how to read. So the bottom-up approach essentially says you start with the pieces. You start with the letters and the sounds and you build up your knowledge to understanding the whole thing. But then you had another crew that believed equally strongly in their idea. When we're teaching kids how to read, teach them whole words. Don't teach them the little parts. And in fact, there was a strong belief that teaching them the little letters and sounds and all the parts was going to be confusing, distracting, and boring, tedious, not necessary. Becoming a skilled reader takes practice and repetition. I mean, the brain has to literally build these pathways from each of the lobes for students to learn how to read. And the method that became popular and made millions of dollars teaching kids to guess and use visual clues is known as whole language and relatedly balanced literacy. In the 60s, there was a system known as three cueing, where kids would guess words and use clues Decades later, knowing this system doesn't work, we still have Lucy Calkins and Fondas and Pinnell selling a version of this idea. And so they're in mass guessing is really what it is. For some reason, the status quo in America keeps bringing us back to this more whole language balanced literacy approach to teaching, I think because it's more appealing if the basic idea is that exposure is enough, if only kids would just figure out how reading works on their own. But it doesn't work that way. <laughs> this is a problem we have to nip in the bud early. Uh, there are certain things that need to be in place and that need to be done when little kids come to school. And if we don't do those things, most of those kids will not become good readers. This is not a question of can we do this. This is a question of will. This is a question of once we decide we want to change this pipeline, once we decide we want a better future collectively and individually, we can get this done. But we need to act and we need to act with urgency. Okay. Kimiana, you were literacy director in Mississippi during the time that the NAEP scores for reading grew faster than any other state in the nation, especially Black and Latino students' performance. Talk, tell us about the approach you took to reading, and considering that a majority of schools of education teacher prep courses use balanced literacy, was it hard to get teachers to follow your lead? Thank you for the question, Ruth. Um, I believe in, in Mississippi, we passed our law in 2013. Um, and we said we need to teach children how to read, but we also said that we're going to help you get there. Um, some of the most important components of our implementation or our rollout included first, what I mentioned earlier about the, the knowledge building, the capacity building for our educators who are the ones who are in classrooms every day. Um, standing in front of children. So we started, we, we put a stake in the ground and, and drew our line in the sand and said that we are going to adopt the science of reading uh, in Mississippi. So we started with professional development to, to increase teacher knowledge in how to teach children how to read using um, or based in the science. But we also put literacy coaches in classrooms. And it has become the norm to 
to, to um, think of our football players, or our basketball players, our athletes to have these coaches, our really high performing athletes to have coaches um, because we know that there's always learning uh, that, that they can, can have, right? That can be done to, to increase their performance. Um, but this notion of coaches being there for teachers to be able to support them as they especially make the shift um, to the science of reading um, has not been embraced in a lot of places. So we wanted to embrace the coaching aspect and, and for coaches to really be there to support teachers in the classroom in, in improving their instruction. Uh, but in addition to the professional development and the coaching, of course, we, we focused on identifying students early through universal screeners. Um, and then of course, teachers knowing what to do in response to that data to be able to provide interventions and also including parents and families with, with literacy nights and parent resources, at-home resources for parents. So when you think about now this space of, of kindergarten through third grade and we're supporting the teachers or the educators, you know, teachers and administrators, we're supporting the students, we're supporting the families. And then the question is, right, where where's higher ed? So we started having these conversations around how um, you know, how we wanted to ensure that our educator preparation programs begin to see themselves in K-12 outcomes because their impact uh, goes far beyond when their candidates cross the stage and receive their degree. Um, their impact is felt as soon as that new teacher steps foot in the classroom on the first day. Um, we did pass a law for an educator, um, a, a, an assessment for licensure. For those who are um, getting licensed in elementary education, they had to pass this assessment of science of reading. Uh, but then it, it took us right back to the same question that I mentioned earlier, which is now the expectation is for the candidates to pass this assessment, but have we really put uh, you know, in place what is needed for to make sure that our staff, our faculty, understood the science of reading as well. And, and changing, making the shift in higher education has proven to be a much larger task uh, than, than that in K-3. Um, and getting buy-in, you know, as I mentioned earlier, is, is one thing that we had to, we had to do. But uh, I think the biggest impact was that we allowed our work to speak for us. So when we started seeing some improvement in places that we had never seen success before. You know, we proved that you can be black and learn how to read, that you can be poor and learn how to read, right? You can be in Mississippi and learn how to read. And to Emily's earlier point, you know, it had become okay. It had become okay for Mississippi to be last and states like Massachusetts to be first. I mean, it was just, we knew what this would look like every year we would play um, musical chairs with Alabama and, you know, other states on the bottom, uh, but, but it had become just a thing. Um, and, and sadly, Mississippians had accepted it as well. But when we got our adults on the same page, um, going in the same direction about what we needed, our state chief, our um, governor, our um, legislature on the same page, then we were able to, to make some things happen. Okay, thank you for that, Kimiana. Um, Emily, would you like to add to that? Um, well, I guess at, at the beginning of what Kimiana was saying when she was talking about the work that they did um, training teachers and needing to have coaches, I think one thing that's just really important here is there's a, there's a tremendous amount for teachers to learn. Uh, you know, and a lot of people did not go into early elementary education necessarily thinking they had to really be experts at written English, which is difficult. Uh, a lot of us are good at using written English, but we can't explain it to someone else. We can't teach it to someone else. And um, so there's a lot of knowledge that teachers haven't been getting in their preparation programs, haven't been getting their professional development that they need to get. So it's not just understanding something about the cognitive science and like how the brain actually learns to read, which I think teachers need to understand partly because it helps them understand the why of this, not because they have to become cognitive scientists or have to be able to tell anyone else about this science. But I think when the teachers themselves understand something about what is going on in our brains when we read and how you go from being a person, a little baby who can't read to a human being who can, what that process is about, many teachers have huge ahas like, oh, right, that's why, that's why I have to do it. So the science of reading, I think is sort of the why. 
And then the really the like what of teacher what teachers need to do is like the structure of the written language and teaching kids reading and spelling. We have to talk about how this has to do with writing too. It, these th these are these are the two sides of the same coin, <laughs> reading and writing, and they uh, they help each other. And and we need to do a better job teaching kids to read and uh, to write and spell. But there's a lot here. There, it, this is not something where you can pass a law or put a policy in place uh, and expect things to happen. I think you have to do what Mississippi did, which is recognize there are a lot of different pieces of it. The teacher prep part, the um, the coaches in schools, the curriculum, there's lots of different pieces. And someone has to be thinking about what all those pieces are, making sure they actually happen. And there has to be some accountability in place. Like, um, is it is it happening or not? So legislatures are passing a lot of laws, but laws are only as good as someone who is going to uh, carry those laws out. And so the legislature can pass them, but it's more about the state departments of education and the superintendents and all the teachers in the state and whether or not they understand the law, they want to implement it, they're fired up about it, and they have the resources and the support to do it. Absolutely. And that's why Mississippi has led the way in this. Wonderful. Uh, Kareem, uh, some thoughts on this? Sure. Um, so I want to take it back to that, that teacher at, at the beginning of the, at a, the clip. Um, you know, Bree is a very, very, I, I just have such a high respect for her. So at the NAACP in Oakland, we actually had a parent come into one of our meetings and talk about how her kid was starting to read, which at that school is not common. And so we were like, what's going on? Let's go check it out. We, we had just started our literacy initiative and um, we saw her working with kids using a particular program or whatever, certain methods. And she had a volunteer in her room who was supporting her and that volunteer who was really supporting her had been chased out of another school. The reason why she had been chased out of that school is because she tried to help there, but they were so bought into the balanced literacy method that they considered it disrespectful that she would come in and say, this is not right. Even though 8% of the kids were reading at that school, when somebody tried to come in and help, they were like, nah, uh -uh. we're going to support these teachers. We got to get to the point where Parental engagement isn't just baking cookies. Nothing wrong with baking cookies, but that 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 you know, listen, chaperone in the field trips and baking the cookies, all that's fine. But we actually have a right, actually, we have a duty to check in on our kids and make sure they get what they need. So I just, you know, so a question that brings up to me is what does it mean to be a partner to the schools, an ally, a, or just a citizen? What does it mean? Sometimes it's okay to disagree. Because a lot of times folks in schools are so entrenched, not all the time, but many times they're so entrenched, especially leadership, that it's, it takes an act of courage for a teacher or a parent to step outside of that and say, nah, that's not right. 12, 15, 20, 30, 40%, this, this doesn't align with my beliefs about what kids are capable of. And so we need to re rethink. That. And if they're not on that same page, you might have to zig when they zag. And that is one of the biggest challenges we have. Everybody's in such a rush to get along and, and all of that that we forget sometimes, you know, in love, we're not going to agree. But we can have real honest conversations on behalf of our kids. Um, so right. I just want to shout out that teacher, even though she's probably not here tonight, but just shout her out because the, the courage she showed was just phenomenal, phenomenal. Absolutely. Thank you, Kareem. Yes, and it does take some shouting. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, panel. And um, right now we're uh, on to our final clip. So Kareem, which brings us back to you and frames reading, not just as a academic, an academic accomplishment, but as a civil right. College, you're gonna have to read a lot and read often. My man, Larry, learned the first two sounds today. The first two letters, what are the first, actually the first three, what are the three letters you learned today? Uh huh. But what letter is it? A. Uh huh. E. Uh huh. C. What does the A make? Ah. How can you remember that? A is for what? A is for apple. What is B for? B is for black. All right. Our country has always prioritized reading. Always, either to intentionally include or exclude certain people.
At the NAACP, we look at literacy as the oars of the rowboat. But how are you going to go anywhere? How are you going to propel yourself forward if you can't read? Our kids have got to be literate in the information age. The question is today, do we have the political will and do we have the moral courage and fortitude to use literacy as a vehicle to include all? I really think that we have to change a little bit of what we're saying because we have said in the past that math is the gatekeeper. No math no, it's isn't. No, it's it's isn't. reading. Yeah. Reading is the, it's the information age. It, it certainly is. If yeah. you can't read, that means you can't access what right. you need to access yeah. in order to move forward with something curricular. That's right. You know uh, that administrative petition that we put out to the board had the eight action items that we wanted y'all to do. Mm -hmm. and here they are. We'll keep this front and center. This petition is like a roadmap. Mm -hmm. It's the result of a lot of stakeholder engagement, mm -hmm. a lot of study, a lot of research about what's working and what's not working around the country. Mm -hmm. um, there's things that, um, there's districts that look like ours, have kids like ours, who are thriving. Mm -hmm. They went from the bottom and they're at the top. Yes, I believe it. Districts are doing it. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but the ones that are, they're doing specific things. Gotcha. We took those things and funneled it into this. You need to have something that doesn't skip steps. Okay, Kareem, I love the way you put it. Reading has always been one of the most important tools, but it can be used to either to include or exclude people from society. There's a huge emphasis in California on creating a more inclusive environment. Is how we teach reading an important part of that? I love the way you put that. Inclusivity. <laughs> in inclusivity. Uh, sounds like such a beautiful word, doesn't it? Inclusive. Sure. Um, yes, it's a part of that. Um, but what, what I'll say is that inclusivity without real access and opportunity um, is not real inclusion. It sets up this permanent underclass. And in, in many ways, that underclass is subservient to the rest of society. It, it's the fulcrum, as we, you know, metaphorically speaking, of of opportunity. Literacy is what everything else hinges on. So, um, and then that last scene there with uh, Dr. Thompson, who's a board member, um, I actually brought him in that meeting, I brought him a message from people who were incarcerated, who had been to schools in Oakland Unified School District. Mm. And I, who, who, who have, who they want to help they don't want to jeopardize state parole. Some of them like a couple of lifers, but the others, they have parole. They didn't want to mess up, but they want to help. They went to prison illiterate. And they were like, man, let me know. I, said, I don't want other people to come through the way I went through. So I was actually giving a board member messages, as we say, from the bottom of the well. And oftentimes we're so disconnected from the real impact of our choices as as parents, teachers, superintendents, school board members, we got to put that front and center. Um, inclusivity is great, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't isolate us from the, the implications and ramifications of our decisions, our choices. And, and if we're going to be real about it, if, you, if you're being inclusive, but one group of folks doesn't have access to, you know, to what they need to make a way, that's not really inclusiveness. That's just that's just like getting another class of people that you can um, manipulate or use or who don't have full access to society. That's Thank a long you. way of saying yes, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Kimiana, want to add to that? Uh, yes. Um, I think that when we talk about um, policy, especially for, for me, for early literacy policy, I do look at passing a law. Um, as especially a law like this as, as an equity law. 
it makes certain things a requirement everywhere. Um, you know, there are certain districts where teachers are getting professional development, but are you getting the right professional development? Or you are screening students, but are you screening for the, um, the critical skills um, that we need in order to address students with reading deficiencies? Um, so I think that um, as we think about passing laws and we think about it being the first step uh, for inclusivity uh, to, to try to level the playing field just a little bit more, um, that, that we also have to consider making sure that the infrastructure is for that department, you know, for those who are going to be responsible for implementing the law is able to, um, to support this implementation, the effective implementation. So I think that, uh, and accountability is, is the key. Yes, we've passed the law, you know, are we going to make sure that, that these requirements that we're putting into place, that they're happening, and again, that they're happening everywhere. Um, there's nothing more powerful than a knowledgeable teacher standing in front of kids who can, on a dime, address students' questions, um, but also address their deficiencies. And I think that, you know, I always say invest in people, um, but we have to make the right investments um, in people. Absolutely. Thank you, Kimiana. Um, Emily, adding to that? Um, I guess I was just thinking again about something that I think was at the very beginning clip. Um, uh, am I unmuted? It says I'm, oh, okay, sorry. I, can hear um, I think one of the things that I've learned in the years that I've been reporting on this is that this is like a lot of people struggle to learn how to read. We're looking at these numbers in terms of the numbers in third and fourth graders or whatever, but you know, these people grow into adults, which we were just talking about and everyone in their life has people around them who it's it, they're keeping it a secret that reading is hard for them and you might not even know that you have people around you and i'm sure there are people listening um who are those people and that's just been really i, I happen to be one of those people i think who learn to read pretty easily my kids learn to read pretty easily Sometimes people are surprised. They think I came to my interest in reporting. Oh, well, you must have had a personal experience with this. And I didn't. And in fact, my eyes have really just had to be opened by other people. It's sort of blown my mind to realize like, whoa, this is a, this is um, something that a lot of people are carrying around with them that they were never really taught very well. And, and they're slow readers and they struggle and they hide it and they never want anyone to ask them to read any, anything out loud and they're embarrassed about it and their spelling is terrible and they're embarrassed about that. And they're very intelligent. Many of them are very successful people. Uh, way too many of them are in prison and many of them are highly successful and they share that many of them share this problem, which is they never really were taught very well how to read and write this English language. And we need to start doing that better for everybody. And not a correlation to intelligence, for sure. Absolutely um, not. And that's a, that's a really important thing for people to understand. You know, this is not about intelligence. Um, right. Very, very smart people struggle uh, to learn how to read. Absolutely. Okay, three of you, we're coming to the end of this discussion, but I'd like to invite you to have some brief comments, uh, final closing thoughts. Um, Kareem, let's start with you. Um, closing thought is just that we, we have to be about business and we have to work together and not get distracted. That's, that's, that's the main thing It's it's, I would encourage everybody to join organizations like the NAACP, get organized, be part of a collective, uh, be willing to work with folks that may not be your normal constituency and, and organization is power and the ability to leverage that on behalf of kids. So I, that, that's all I'll say, we have to get busy. And that means getting out of our comfort zone and, and do what we have to do on behalf of students. Wonderful. Um, Emily? Um, yeah, I guess I would say that I think one of the things that's happening right now around the country is a lot of teachers are having their eyes opened about all of this. And I think there are a lot of teachers out there who are really eager to learn more about this and do a better job. Many of them who had that feeling in their gut, mm, something was missing, something wasn't quite right. I had always had two or three or 10 or 15 kids in my class who weren't reading very well and I didn't know what to do. And I thought I was doing everything I could and everything I was taught to do. So there are a lot of teachers out there who are on board with this. And I think that that is the most important thing actually. And 
Uh, if you're a school leader or a policymaker, know that in your school district, in your state, there are lots of teachers who want to do better and are doing better. There's a lot of teachers who are teaching themselves this stuff on the weekends and reading late into night and into the night and paying to go to webinars and to conferences on their own and paying for training on their own. And we need to support those teachers and know how many of them are out there and recognize them and thank them. Thank them. Thank you. Um, Kimiana, final thoughts? Final thoughts. All right. Since we've talked about community, we've talked about our educators. Uh, I'll talk just a little bit about, you know, our, our parents and families and, of course, our 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 teachers and our, our staff, those that are at our state boards of education and, of course, our, our um, departments of education um, for our parents and families ask questions. Uh, now that we've begun to have this national conversation and we are more aware about certain curricula, that do not teach children how to read, um, you know, be aware of what's going on with your child, ask questions, ask the right questions. Um, also for those who are uh, in, in your state boards of education or even your building level principals, you know, I always say your agenda reflects your priorities. Are you, are you asking about the data? Are you identifying children, not a percentage of kids, but like real kids? Uh, that make up those numbers and are you requiring and supporting your teachers in addressing those um, those deficiencies that that the students may have um, and then again you know just for our educators find your people because there are people there are people who are on this call right now people who are joining you know as Emily said all, all types of you know social media groups or, or um, listening to podcasts and, and really just trying to connect with others um, to learn more and, and we want to make sure that you're learning from each other and that you're learning the right things. Um, so I'll just say to everyone, you know, find your people, make it a priority and, and make it a loud priority. Wonderful. Okay. Well said. All right, panel. Many thanks goes to you, Kareem, Emily, and Kamiana. Thank you for tonight's impactful discussion and thank you for your tireless efforts in regards to literacy. Also, I want to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in tonight to be part of this important conversation about how best to teach kids to read and ultimately give the gift of literacy for all. And finally, the Right to Read documentary will be available to the public in March 2023. If you'd like to find out when it's coming to your town or how to organize your own screening, you can go to www.therighttoreadfilm.org and sign up for updates through its newsletter. Again, thank you to everyone and good night.